My talk's not really about the end of the world. I don't, wouldn't phrase it quite that way. I just, maybe it's about the beginning of the world, a new world. So I've spent a lot of time working on things like black holes and elementary particles, all sorts of really fun physics. But uh, a couple of years ago, I moved to Singapore for a while, and I wanted to change my life. And so I decided to come down to Earth, think about our planet here. And so I want to tell you a little known fact, which is that the Earth is round, was one of the first things I learned. Uh, now, you probably thought you already knew that, <clears throat> and most people know that in an intellectual way, but I think most of us don't know that the Earth is finite in size in a truly uh, visceral way. We don't truly know it because we're living as if it were infinite in size. For example, we live in a period in history when the population growth is almost vertical in this chart. This is population since the last ice age. So we expect that everything will be growing. Everything should be growing. Economic growth is good. Growth of everything is good. But of course, that can't last forever. Luckily, in fact, the population growth is slowing right now, even though you wouldn't see it from this chart. But in the last 10 or 20 years, it started to slow. So at least in terms of population, we're starting to realize as a species that we've reach the size of our planet. But in other ways, we haven't realized that. All of our technology here, all this wonderful uh, technology I'm using in this talk, it's all powered mainly by digging up carbon and burning it. And that's the history of the Industrial Revolution, really. Starting in 1800 and going on till now, we burnt first more coal, then more oil, then more natural gas, and this is been shooting up dramatically, and it's really an energy civilization that we are we're in right now. We're in a civilization where everything is based on the use of more and more energy. But unfortunately, almost all that energy is created by the simple method of burning carbon. So of course there's going to be more carbon dioxide in the air. This is a famous graph of a scientist who started measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the air starting in 1960. And just since then, the amount has gone up by a third, from 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million. You can see the seasonal variations. That's what nature is doing. But this upwards growth is due to human activities. So that means that just in the last 30 years, we've significantly changed the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. We've reached the point where the at Earth's atmosphere is changing faster than it has really in all of recorded history of the Earth, as far as geologists know, and it's because of us. Sorry. And, sorry. So, since carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, it means things are getting warmer. It keeps heat in, keeps it from radiating out into space. And so, since the Industrial Revolution till now, the Earth's average temperature has gone up about a degree, which doesn't sound like much, but actually that's a huge amount of change for such a short amount of time. If you look back in the history of the Earth, it's very rare that it goes up that much. And there's no reason to think that's going to stop anytime soon. It's halted slightly over the last 15 years, but I'm pretty sure that that's just a temporarily glitch. If you see, it goes up and down quite a lot, but the general trend is up, and we've got a lot more carbon left in the ground. We've got about three times as much carbon left to burn than we have burnt so far. So we could keep pushing this up a lot higher unless we decide to do something about it. So what is the effect of that? Well, lots of effects. Here's one that's already happened. Many effects are still in the future, but here's something that happened since 1979. This is the area of the sea ice near the North Pole. And it's gone down from about 6 million square kilometers down to 2.5. Uh, this is the minimum area at the summertime. So we've basically gotten rid of half of the North Pole in terms of ice. And scientists are busy taking bets on what's going to happen. When will it go all the way down to zero? So in the summer, we'll have no ice in the Arctic Ocean. Maybe 30 years from now, no one's sure exactly. To really see what 
how dramatic this is, I think it's good to look back further in time. People like to talk about natural climate cycles, and they're indeed important. These are the ice age cycles. When there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, it's hot. This is a graph of the amount of carbon dioxide, but it goes along with temperature. So in between ice age cycles, there's a lot of CO2. In, during the ice ages, there's a lot less. It goes up and down. At the end of the last ice age, it went up to about 250 parts per million. But then something new happened, and that's us. When, the, when we started the Industrial Revolution, it shot up to almost 400. And in fact, it's gone up even further since this graph was made. It's, it's closer to 400 now. So if you look at it from the point of view of the history of uh, the civilization, it, doesn't, it looks like a rather slow change. But if you look at it from the point of view of the history of the Earth, it's an incredibly rapid change. And again, there's no reason to think that this is going to stop anytime soon, because people aren't doing what it's required to stop it. So what's happening is that we're changing the whole Earth, and that has lots of effects, way too many to list. But for example, species all around the world are moving. They're moving towards the poles where it's cooler. They're moving at a rate of four kilometers each decade, which especially for things like forests is pushing the limit to which they could do that. They die out at the southern end, they grow at the northern end. The oceans are also becoming much more acidic because a lot of carbon dioxide gets dissolved by the ocean. And that's making things like uh, uh, seashells and so on tend to dissolve. They don't grow as well and they're starting to die in many places. The rate of extinction of species, which is already, thanks to our human activities, about 10 times its average geological level, will increase, and no one really knows how, what fraction of species will survive this transformation. This transformation, which is not just due to global warming, but it's due to the Earth becoming a fully human-run activity. Nature, basically, as we know it, is over. We've left what we call the Holocene, which is the period of time geologists call the, the present, quote-unquote, but that's past now. We're in a new geological era which they call the Anthropocene, because it's the era in which the Earth's climate is dominated by human activities and is rapidly changing. We don't really know where it's going to go, but we just know that it's changing. So why is it happening? Well, you could blame global warming. You could blame global warming on use of uh, carbon. But you have to go back, I think, further than that, because global warming is just one of many things that's going on hand in hand. And I think it's all happening because, one, we're pretending that the Earth is infinite. We're pretending that if you make a bunch of trash, you can move somewhere else and get away from that trash. Carbon dioxide is a form of trash that's hard to notice because it's invisible, but that's, that's basically the garbage we're shooting up into the air. So because we're pretending the Earth is infinite, we're pretending that nothing we do can really affect the biosphere. We don't take the biosphere into account in our bookkeeping, not in our economics, not really in our daily life. And we are fooled into thinking that exponential growth is a normal condition. If you talk, about, talk to economists, they say that the GNP should be growing 3% each year or else it's a recession. The GNP is a funny thing. I can increase the GNP by buying a lot of paper and burning it in my driveway. I've, I've increased consumption and increased the uh, the GNP that way. Uh, it's not a very good measure of what we really want. So pretending that all these three facts are true makes them stop being true. If you pretend that you can <coughs> do as anything without affecting the biosphere, then you bring yourself to the situation where you, that no longer is true. It, it, these are the opposite of a self-fulfilling prophecy. These are, these are ideas that will bring about inevitably their own end. So we're, we will come crashing into the brick wall of reality one way or another. It's not if it will happen. It's really a matter about when it will happen. We can either do it now or we can wait and we'll have to do it later. Nature has a way of forcing itself upon, our, upon us. Uh, to some extent, that actually reassures me. I used to always worry when I started thinking about the environment, you know, will people ever get the message? And now I know the answer to that question. Yes, we will get the message. 
It's just a matter of when. And the sooner you get the message, the more we can steer a course that will make things pleasant for us. So as I said, one fact that's really crucial is that population growth is already slowing, and so the population explosion is not the main thing to be concerned about now. So people talk a lot about global warming. So let me give you a little bit of ideas about what we could do about that. So the key thing to know is that burning a little bit less carbon is not enough. Turning down your thermostat or buying a car with better gas mileage, they're not going to be good enough. They're good things to do, I'm not denying that, but they're not the solution. The problem is that most carbon dioxide stays in the air for hundreds of years or even thousands of years. So if you put a little less carbon dioxide into the air, you're slowing the process of global warming, but you're not stopping it. So to really stop it, we would need to leave fossil fuels unburnt. So we're going to do a mixture of these four things. There's really no way out. We're either going to decide to leave some fossil fuels unburnt. As I said, there's a lot more of them than we've burnt so far, still sitting there in the ground. We, or learn to live with a hotter climate, or suck carbon dioxide out of the air and put it underground, which is hard to do on a large enough scale to be really useful. That's not a magic solution. People are working on doing that. People in China already are building coal-burning power plants that suck the carbon dioxide out of the smoke stack smokestack and put it underground, but, it's, but, the, but that's a, a tough thing to do. Or finally, actively cool the earth by various methods. For example, putting sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, which creates mist, which reflects sunlight. Um, people are already starting to think about solutions like that because they're afraid that we're not going to do enough of the first solution. So I think we're going to do a mixture of some of these solutions. We're definitely going to have to learn to live with a hotter climate. We're already learning to live with it. But I hope that we can do a mix of these activities in a sane way uh, to help deal with our problem. To realize how big the problem is, look at what these Princeton authors came up with in 2004. They said, what do we need to do to keep carbon emissions flat for the next 50 years? Remember, keeping it as flat is not good enough. That just means that the problem keeps getting worse. But it's still different than if we don't do anything, then carbon emissions would continue to grow. So they estimated that to keep carbon emissions flat, we'd have to cut carbon emissions from what we otherwise would do by 7 billion tons per year. So they chop that into seven wedges, each a billion tons of carbon per year. So what are some examples of those wedges? Those are big, hard things to do. You could replace 700 billion watts of coal power by solar. So that would take multiplying our current amount of solar power by 20, by 2054. That's one wedge. You could increase wind power. You could increase wind power by a factor of seven from what we have now worldwide. Or nuclear, you could double nuclear power. Remember, you need to do seven of these things. I've listed three, I'll list a couple more. You can make all cars twice as efficient without having people drive more. Another one is that you could cut carbon emissions by 25% in all buildings and appliances across the world. This last one is by far the easiest of the ones that I've listed because there are a lot of leaky buildings that let the heat out, and this would be one that you could do that would actually save people money. So this people should definitely do. But remember, I've only listed five of these things, and you need to do seven. They list more. And remember, seven is just to keep the problem getting worse at the same rate. Some really good news is that the, United, uh, is that the uh, consulting company, McKinsey and Company, has argued that the world could cut carbon emissions by 10 billion tons per year at roughly no net cost by balancing measures that are uh, increased efficiency that actually save money with efficiency measures that cost money. But of course, the problem is 
that just because you do something that saves you money doesn't mean that you're going to do the other thing that costs you money. So we have to figure out how to do a lot of things. They break it down into lots of smaller pieces, but half of them cost money. So to incentivize people to do the things that cost money, I really believe we need to put a price on carbon. The EU is, of course, way ahead of the United States on this, so I shouldn't be lecturing you. You should all go to the United States and, and tell, tell people there. Uh, at least my own state of California now has a carbon cap and trade system that they started in January of this year. So maybe we'll eventually get the federal government to follow us. There are lots of economic objections to any price on carbon, but I claim that most of those objections are pretending that we live on an infinitely large planet and we could just go on doing business as usual without running into serious trouble. So please tell all your friends we're living on a finite planet and no physical quantity can grow exponentially forever. We need to change our attitude and think of economics as just a small portion of a larger subject of ecology. And I think what we should do, because we all want things to keep growing and getting and get better, is to transform our attitude towards economics, move away from what you might call a matter economy. So once upon a time, people had stone tools and they picked berries and killed uh, animals to eat, mainly using matter. We switched, as soon as we invented fire, to the energy economy, where we realized that harnessing other forms of energy could do the work for us. But that is what got us into our current jam of using vast amounts of energy for everything. We're now trying to switch over towards an information economy. Information is much more abstract than matter or energy. So you can have a lot more of it around without getting in trouble. But even so, if you know how much energy those servers at Google use, you can realize that an information economy relies on an energy economy. But I think that information is not the last step. Information is useless if, if you don't do anything that affects yourself with it. So something more like a knowledge economy or experience economy is what the goal of the information economy should be. And you can have lots of experience and knowledge without necessarily using so many bit megabytes of uh, data on those Google servers. And really, even knowledge is useless in, unless it's turned into something like wisdom. You could know all the facts in the world, but it wouldn't necessarily help anybody, including yourself. The great thing about wisdom is that it seems, apparently, that you can have as much of it as you want without it polluting the environment or causing trouble. And so ultimately, we could have an economy that had a light impact on the planet and we could all be enjoying ourselves because we'd be wise enough to uh, realize that there are ways to enjoy ourselves that don't use up the resources of the Earth so dramatically. So this is, I think, is the big project of our age right now, is to do this transition. We will have to do it, I claim. So let's get started doing it. I have an organization I'm involved in called the Azimuth Project. So if you look at www.azimuthproject.org, you could talk to us. And, but I'm sure you all have your own ideas for great things to do. So let's get to work. Thanks.